and you're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. This week we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers, OutdoorAdventureTrailers.com. The best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Cutthroat Furled Leaders, the only leaders that I use. Cutthroat Furled Leaders are guaranteed to perform for whatever species of fish you're chasing. Check them out at CutthroatFurledLeaders.com. Save 15% promo kayak. StoneFlyNets.com. The very best in handcrafted and custom fishing nets made in the great state of Arkansas. Check out Stonefly Nets at StoneFlyNets.com. And that reminds me, I really need to get a hold of all of those guys because uh, I didn't send invoices out in August like I normally do. So (laughs) um, actually, we're not sponsored for this year yet because I'm lazy. (laughs) Guys, I really think that you're going to enjoy this show tonight. Um, everybody knows my my loving relationship with Rick from Oasis, and Rick got me this week's guest and next week's guest. Um, he, he's, he's the one responsible for Jack Dennis being on the show. I mean, Rick knows everybody. And so we have Ryan McFall this week, and he is the one that runs the Dubbing Brush Fly Table or the dubbing brush. I'll just let you say it, Ryan. Uh, go ahead and lay out the socials there because I'll butcher it. So, okay, that's a good thing to bring up, though. I actually don't run that page, so I meant I to bring that did. up. No, Rick kind of outed me and said that I did. I run the Game Changer group, um, <laughs> which is similar, and we use a lot of dubbing brushes, but I do not actually have any connection to the dubbing brush uh, page. Besides, I'm on there a lot. I like to see what other people are making. Um, I try to contribute content when I can, but I cannot claim the ownership of that group. So, well, he sorry, Rick. Outed you and said that you were the one. <laughs> I listened to that episode and I was like, mm, no, not quite right. <laughs> Close enough. I mean, you're a major contributor, so that has at least you. You're not bringing down the band hammer. No, 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 no. That's yeah. not me. I do in the the game changer group. Unfortunately, that's part of the part of the job. But yeah. Uh, so you did mention socials. Um, McFall flies M C F as in Frank A L L flies uh, on Instagram. I don't really have a Facebook page other than my personal page, and I don't really add just anybody. I'm kind of weird like that. So, um, but you can find me in some of these different groups and on Instagram mostly. Yeah, and that's great. And. You know, I think a lot of us, especially those of us that are doing something like I have the podcast and we're we're relaunching Drinking on the Fly. We're actually recording this week again, um, which for those of you listening was last week. So it's probably already out. Um, That's almost the only reason I have social media anymore, Mm -hmm. because it's just gotten to be such a scary and ugly place. And, you know, you talk about Banhammer. And having to ban people. And it's really a sad thing when we have and should have such a great friendly community for fly tires that that does happen. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. But dubbing brushes is kind of what we're going to talk about and game changers. um, Mm -hmm. Two of my favorite things. Um, I am a sucker for a good game changer. And I had not seen a game changer until one of my friends had purchased i think he purchased three and i think it was like 35 dollars was shipping and i i just i thought i was gonna die and i tried tying some and they looked fine but then i got the scissors after them and they looked horrible yeah yeah Yeah. and so go ahead and talk to us a little bit about that to start with if you don't mind Sure. Yeah. So I, I've been really into tying game changers now for about two and a half years or so. And, um, when they first came out, mine looked like everybody else's. They were as ugly as could be. I didn't want to own them, but I will say even the ugliest ones have still caught fish. So if anybody's feeling intimidated by it, um, go take it to the water and see what happens. So, um, But for anybody who doesn't know, a game changer is a fly made up of multiple shanked uh, sections, almost like spines. Um, That's the premise of it. You can take it a bunch of different directions. But there are lots of different kinds. I think I've heard on the show people talk about feather game changers. So those are made out of feathers. Um, There you go. I love my feather game changers. There you go. Um, I tend to make a lot out of brushes. So that kind of converges the dubbing brush part and the game changer part. Um, you can also make them out of other materials. So like I have a couple just sitting around, like this is a bucktail changer. Um, 
So it's made up of bucktail and it's got brushes as well. But uh, it's a really adaptable pattern, has a lot of movement when tied right. And um, also, in my opinion, has a lot of hype and a lot of hate behind it, too. So there, there's wide varieties of opinions on these. Yes. And if you're a hater, just go ahead, leave a five star review right now. And don't listen to the rest of the show because that's basically what this is going to be about. I and that's all right. Found, yeah, I have found game changers so effective in the early spring and the late fall. Mm-hmm. I have found mm-hmm. that's when their time to shine is for mm-hmm. warm water fish. Now you're yeah. fishing some bigger ones in salt water too. So this is something that you can tie small for trout. You can tie as big as you want for largemouth bass. And then of course, musky pike any of those big predatory fish you look at a lot of those what is it the uh oh yeah well there's a comparison yes so if you're (laughs) watching on youtube you can see an extremely small versus an extremely large but like the buford is a giant sort of game changer style you can put the shanks in and make a buford that's 18 inches long i mean Mm -hmm. so much to do what do you um prefer to do when you're tying these do you i mean are you using a lot of synthetic materials maybe talk about that and the trimming process versus the not trimming process if you make a brush correctly absolutely yeah so i i do tend to do a lot of synthetic made changers um i fish primarily still water um when i'm not fishing salt and i quite honestly i live i was just talking to you pre-show i i live at the ocean I don't fish the salt water as much as I could. So I'm sorry to everybody. I know, I know. I have a kayak, so that's relevant. Um, but I I do not get out there as much as I maybe could. So with that said... It's sharks, uh, right? It's not sharks. Um, <laughs> I've grown up here. Sharks are sharks are cute. Um, no, it's, it's time. That's going to be my excuse for the day. It might be a different yeah. excuse tomorrow. Um, so I do fish a fair bit of still water for largemouth bass, um, bluegill. I've caught crappy on game changers, which is kind of crazy. Um, so yeah, so I'm fishing still water and clear water. And so I'm, I'm trying to match the profile and the color as much as I possibly can. And for that reason, I've kind of defaulted more to the brush style changers or finesse changers, which is made out of a chenille, um, that's kind of mass produced. Um, Something that has some translucency, if possible, matches the profile pretty accurately and is something that the fish are less likely to come up to and kind of like sniff and turn around at. Um, I have caught fish on feather changers around here. It works. I just tend to have better effectiveness with the more realistic profiles and um, more accurate profile translucency, that kind of stuff. Um, So with that said, you brought up talk about trimming and that kind of process and if you can use brushes to affect the trimming process. So um, I'm just going to pull up random flies for the those who are watching. But I I tie a lot of changers that are just all one color, monochromatic. I tie some that I add um, color to the back of. All of mine get trimmed regardless of how well I can make a brush. And I, I do say... Uh, with no arrogance involved. I've made a lot of brushes. So Mm -hmm. I think that I'm pretty decent at it compared to the average Joe walking down the street. Um, And so with that said, I still have to trim mine. Um, I use Anadromous scissors. Um, They have razor scissors. That's what they call them. They're fantastic. Um, That's my preferred for what I do. Um, But you can make brushes that are tapered to some degree, which It does not save much time in the trimming process. It can, but it saves a lot in material cost. Um, So you're not cutting off all this material that's rendered uh, usable. Um, So I'm making a tapered brush the best I can, thin to thick, um, or thin to thick to thin, if I'm trying to match the tail section, the shoulder section, which is the widest, and then the the head, um, which narrows up a bit. Um, and then I'm trimming for a while and I tend to spend as long trimming as I do tying, which people don't like to hear, but it's not a quick process. Yeah, I think that's one of the most intimidating factors. I know that was for me. Um, you're talking about using the Andromenus razor scissors. I picked up a pair of thinning shears from a haircutting place mm-hmm. and those seem to work well for me. 
but also I have gotten to where I am tapering my brushes when I make them. Yeah. And I just out of curiosity, if you're like me, are you taking fewer wraps in the back and more wraps in the front to make the profile stand up heavier? And if so, can you explain that more eloquently than, than I can? I can try. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, I, essentially let me back all the way up for those people who may not even know what a dubbing brush is a dubbing brush is it's a wire folded over itself or you could say two wires um, that spins up material and so for anybody watching like i've got a bunch of brushes fancy big dubbing loop yeah exactly exactly instead of using your thread you're using wire to make the dubbing loop so i think the first game changer i made i used the dubbing loop to make right so and so if you're making your own brushes or your own dubbing loops, you can affect the density of the brush by how much material you put in it. So you could make a really thin brush with just a little bit of material. That has its benefits, that has its cons as well. Um, the other way that you can adjust the density of the material on your hook shank or on the shank on your game changer is by wrapping your brush more times. And so you're effectively adding more material to that section of your fly. So what you just brought up a minute ago, Sean, is the idea of having less brushes near the back or less, sorry, less wraps of the brush at the back and increasing the wraps as you go forward. And I do that to add density. And that has a lot of different reasons. One, like you mentioned, is to help stand the fibers up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Uh, When they're packed closer together, similar to deer hair, they stick up more than they flare out or fall back. Um, The other reason is the more density you have, the more water push ability you have. So the more you're disrupting the water. Um, If you have a really kind of flimsy game changer or any other brush fly, Um, it collapses in the water. And that's not necessarily a good thing. You kind of want that push through the water. It also makes a difference in physics and how the water kind of runs around the fly too. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but hopefully that answers a little bit of what you were saying. Yeah, and I mean, dubbing brushes, if you're, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being rude about this at all because, you know, I'm not exactly the guy who runs out and buys the greatest and newest things to this podcast. I have a lot of friends. But when it comes to dubbing brushes, they can be very expensive depending on what, because I mean, what is it's Rick's what running like 150 bucks for his table. Something in that. Yeah. I mean, you can try and make one. I tried to make one and I think I put like $45 into just an epic failure (laughs) and just sort of said the hell with it. I'm not doing it. And then once I got talking to Rick, it really turned into a good thing. And I absolutely love it. I actually, you know, I've talked about the sow bug enough. I'm not going to go back into that. Um, But what gets me is there's a lot of material in there. And I'm going to go ahead and plug the mad scientist, because if you're getting into dubbing brushes, you're going to spend a lot of money. And the best place to get the material to start with dubbing brushes is from Fly Tires Dungeon. And I don't know if you've ever used them. Oh, yeah. I find the water silk. Mm -hmm. And the big game hair are excellent Mm -hmm. for being able to wrap more and build that taper to push that water. Mm -hmm. And for the price point, you can make dozens and dozens and dozens of brushes for less than $20. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to plug how, how much they focus on different colors. Um, Mm -hmm. so I've gone lots of different routes in terms of sourcing materials and there are definitely colors like for me an olive is a really hard color to get done correctly. You can find like a Kelly green kind of olive and I'm going to be a bit of an olive snob here, but I want a good olive and, um, and that's a color that they do really, really well. That is one of like, I don't know, 50 or 60 colors. It seems like they have. So yes, I've definitely used them. They have such a wide variety of material and it's not just synthetic fibers. They also have eyes. They also have, uh, you can buy shanks from them too. So Mm -hmm. fantastic place to get material, especially if you're starting out and feeling intimidated. Yeah, and uh, if you're tying uh, if you're tying anything like a crawfish bug back and baby mm-hmm. bug back, depending on the size, articulated crawfish are something that I am working on right now. I That's think awesome. Articulated crawfish are going to be the next big thing, and so I'm wanting to tie a shank with a crawfish tail or weight somewhere on it, and mm-hmm. then have the hook 
floating up, maybe using pine squirrel or feathers with yeah. a little bit of floatant on those and then the dubbing brush for the two sections of the body and then just a piece of that bug back across the top and maybe maybe a wire if I really think it needs to be sectioned. But a little bit of glue should hold it down. It should be fine. So when we talk about game changers, we're not specifically limited to a minnow. We can do all sorts of things with these. And that's I think that makes them really interesting. Fantastic point. Yeah, I would I would completely agree. Um, in fact, I don't know if you've seen the Changer Craw or the Game Changer Craw. Yeah, um, I, that was that. Who was that? Was that Kelly that did that one, or was that? Uh, was that I think it Ozark? was Blaine. Um, Blaine. Blaine. Yeah, it was Blaine. Blaine mm-hmm. did that. Yes, because he did. Mm-hmm. He did the original Game Changer, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He did. Yeah. There's. Yeah. Let's go with, yes, well, he did. There's yeah, speculation, but who knows? I mean, right. I don't know. Um, I say he did it. Um, well, he's the one at least has the material named after him. If you go to the store and you buy Blaine's Game Changer material, it's mm-hmm. a lot more expensive than making a dubbing brush after mm-hmm. the initial investment. If you're only going to tie a handful of them to see if you like them, by all means, buy one of the Flyman Company boxes that you get enough material to tie six and be done and be happy. But if Mm -hmm. this is something that you like fishing, definitely look at making your own brushes because we're going to get into more uses for brushes than just this. Yeah. And you also, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but you can customize. So you can do, like I do color fades and stuff like Mm -hmm. that where you can't buy that in a big box store. Uh, Yeah. So you did mention a second ago, like a a crawfish, and you mentioned Mm -hmm. the adaptability of kind of the different shanks. Um, this is just a little weird thing I, I made one day, but it's almost like a Pat's rubber leg um, yep. for trout fishing, but it's got like five articulations. It takes way too long to tie and I'll probably lose it on the first rock that I hit. And it, this is what I do. I, I overcomplicate things because I enjoy it, um, but it mm-hmm. adds a lot of movement and a lot of life to a fly that otherwise may be a bit more rigid. Uh, do you guys so. have Helgramites in your water? We do. Um, I will say we don't have them where I'm at right now, but in Western North Carolina, there are some. Um, so this would work seen, quite well. I've seen beautiful articulated helm, hel- hel- helmogrites and there are brush. Again, it's a brush, but mm-hmm. it's got that back on it mm-hmm. to give it that hard look. I need beautiful. to, I need to mess with that bug back some. I have some and I, I honestly don't know that I've put it on a single fly. So perhaps I, you've inspired me, Sean. I use more of the baby bug back because it's thinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I were working on bigger flies, like bigger shrimp flies, I definitely, then I use the full bug back But Mm -hmm. because I'm mostly smally fishing around here and trout fishing. The baby bug back is about the right size for me. But if you buy the regular bug back, you can slice it and get pretty much whatever you want. So then you can do it by size. And we're talking about dubbing brushes and versatility and sharp scissors. (laughs) You figure it out on your own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a pro tip right there. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's really neat. And I think that dubbing brushes have given us a lot more creativity. Um, I sold uh, Don at breambugs.com my carp crepe. And it's made up of all hot fibers. And it's a jig. And it's a dubbing brush. It's a couple of wraps of a dubbing brush. And that hair is real coarse. But it moves and it has the addition of glowing. And Mm -hmm. that is a fly that I really never thought would be, for me, I was just messing around. I never really thought it would be so productive. What are some of the ways that you use dubbing brushes that maybe people don't think about immediately? So I, let me back all the way up. I made maybe three dubbing loops before I got into making dubbing brushes. For some reason... (laughs) Dubbing loops for me just oh, didn't, they, they just, yeah, they really are. And like, I've got cool, fancy tools to do it. And I thought that that would make me inspired to make more. And I just, I always default to making a brush. And so you can basically, in my opinion, add almost any material to a fly through a a dubbing brush if you desire. So you can make only flash brushes, which I've done. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You can use natural materials. So I have bucktail brushes that I make. Um, 
you can do only rubber legs. So I've added a wide variety of things into a dubbing brush. And so I'm answering your question with a very broad answer, but you can do anything with a dubbing brush, really. Um, the limitations that I have found are having one color up top and one color on the bottom. So I could stack a little bit of craft fur on the top that is black, and I could stack craft fur on the bottom of a shank that's white. I cannot do that with a dubbing brush. I would have to do one color or a blend of colors that would be kind of put in a round um, fashion. So that might be a limitation. But other than that, Sean, you can use a dubbing brush for applying almost any material um, if you're creative enough and if you are willing to play around with it. It takes some experimentation. Yeah, and that's and that's a really neat thing that you're, you're talking about those different, how, how you mix things together. In a dubbing brush, you really have two sections. You have the outside and the inside. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of red, very, very short red, mm -hmm. and then lay white over the top of it. Mm -hmm. So that gives me a bloodline. Yeah. Especially if I'm going to make a longer game changer. So I'm just going to, or excuse me, a longer fly, mm -hmm. or a saltwater fly that I'm only going to do about five wraps at most. And right. then just have that fly sweeping down. So I have maybe three to four inches of, of fiber behind the hook, behind the bend mm -hmm. of the hook, not even behind the hook point, behind the bend of the hook. But that red is right up there and shining like a gill plate. Let's right. Say you're right. going to do a baby rainbow trout. You might want to use a muted pink on that Absolutely. center line to give it that nice distinctive pink. So a, a lot of guys uh, use markers. Mm -hmm. um, the frugal fly ro fly rotter. I know I've spoken about this before, and Copic markers and sharpies with certain kinds of little airbrush holders. I think he's even done a video where he holds a sharpie and uses compressed air in a can for cleaning a computer and wow. spraying that Sharpie on there to make those details. So mm -hmm. a Sharpie with a synthetic fiber really does a good job and that gives you more control. But that almost brings us into more of the artistic area and outside of the fly area where, I mean, let's be, let's face it, buddy. I mean, Ryan, you know, as well as I do, white catches. You know, Absolutely. White, black, olive, and tan and silver, maybe they catch. You don't really need anything else. Yeah. Um, I'm sure and that would get I, some. I hear eyes. Everybody, that's the big debate. Do you put eyes on or not? Well, guess what? A black Sharpie with a small twist, you've got an eye. This is true. This is true. So real fast, maybe you've already talked about this on your podcast. Are you, do you default to adding eyes or are you like an eyes and eyes and eye? It doesn't really matter. <sighs> I default to eyes, but I know full well they're going to come off while I'm fishing. But this I hear is you. just because I have like people going through my fly box constantly. Mm -hmm. and so, like, I kind of have to look like, you know, the, 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 you know, the store selling the flies when my friends go through them. Now, understood. Five casts later, there may be no eyes and they're still hooking up, but at least when they put it on, you know. I, yeah. Do you have friends like that that don't tie? that you have to tie for? If you, I do. if you don't, then I need to meet your friends. <laughs> no, I do. I uh, I have a couple of friends that tie, um, but I definitely have a lot of friends that don't tie. But I will say my friends that do not tie are not very selective. Um, maybe. <laughs> so I need to meet. I'll trade you some friends. How's that? Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. We can talk after the show here and figure that out. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I am such a sucker for adding eyes to a fly. Um, I, I know in the back of my head and it pains me to audibly say this, it probably makes like 5% difference, maybe yeah. even not that, but oh my gosh, I'm going to fish it better if it has eyes on it. And so yeah. to me, it's worth adding them, even if they do yeah. fall off very quickly, um, yeah. which is a pain, but, um, yeah. so, and, you know, the thing is. I mean, if you're fishing stained and dirty water, and especially if you're fishing for ditch pickles, <laughs> they're only they're hammering that movement. Yeah, they don't. They, I mean, we and I, I say this, and people are going to start emailing me. Quit saying we give them too much credit. <laughs> they're fish for crying out loud. Yeah, you know? yeah, we very much do, and I think there are areas where they adapt and get very smart. And then uh -huh. there are areas where they stay fish. And um, maybe we need to remember that they still stay fish. Yeah. Um, and there are fisheries that are hard to fish. Totally. 
there are some that it's like doop a doop a doop a doop and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's got I you could tie it in hot pink and they're just gonna hit the movement. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So um have you ever tied very, very small dubbing brushes? And if so, are you, you changing your wire? And then let's get into wire discussion because that's the first thing I get asked. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. So yes, I have made very small ones. Um, I have found for myself that the challenge with making a very small dubbing brush is not the wire. It is getting it to stay in between the two wires when you pull the tray out or you drop your tray, depending on what kind of um, dubbing brush table you have, those tiny, tiny fibers want to shift a little bit and can often fall out. And so that's a real pain. Um, if I am going for a really, really small dubbing brush, something that I've used is a hair trimmer, um, like a to buzz your head, which is what uh -huh. I use. Um, I'm also losing my hair really quick, so maybe I won't have to need for that forever. Um, with that said, get a cat. Get a cat. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, with that said, <laughs> I will spin up my brush and then I'll put my tray. And once again, I'm talking about a, an Oasis um, dubbing brush table. I'll put my tray back underneath. And so I've got a flat surface and then I've got 180 degrees or kind of a, a dome shape of my brush that's sitting there. And I'll take my hair trimmer and put on whatever guard I need and run it along my brush and it will trim to whatever um, length I ask it to trim to. Yeah, and so well, that, that guard length, yeah. Yeah. And so that I have found to be the most effective way to make a consistent small brush all the way across. So I'll, I'll run it across one time. I'll spin my brush, almost like flipping my brush over, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll run it over again. And maybe you need to do a third pass sometimes, but that's how I make smaller, um, smaller brushes. And there are a lot of uses for them. I, I held up this little Pat's rubber leg thing. This is a tiny little brush. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I even really trimmed that brush more than a snip or two as I was yeah. tying it. Um, so and that's, you meant that's why I asked. I've heard of guys using dubbing brushes for midges, and I'm like, how the hell do you keep it stuck? Because wax is your friend. Let's just get that out there for anybody that's thinking about this. Do not do anything until you have wax. Because so we should talk about that. But go ahead. Yeah, and then wire picking out your wire, and you have to know what size you're going to have. But the post trimming for because when I heard they were doing midges, I'm like, this is not how to. And I'm like, you know, I'm derp a derp a derp. I'm like sitting at home trying to do it, and I've got all this little and I, it, like you said, it just fell right out. And I had like yeah. waxed that thing forever. But let's go yeah. talk about wax and then wire, if that's okay. Yeah. So this is a hotly debated thing in the tiny niche market of dubbing brushes. So I say hotly debated. It's not like our politicians are talking about this. This is just between like me and three other people. Um, with that said, I do not use wax. Um, oh, Rick is going to reach through the audio and smack you. I don't use wax. You um, don't. Why do you not use wax to hold it in place? I have never found that it's necessary if you use the table correctly. And I say correctly, let me back up because that came right out of my mouth very quickly. Yeah, There's Rick no right or wrong way to use it. I know, I know. Sorry, Rick. Um, He's calling this is, you now. This is payback for you saying I ran the <laughs> dubbing brush group. Um, now we're even. <laughs> no, I. Uh, let me back up and rephrase, not correctly. If you use the dubbing brush table the way that I use it, um, which is just the way that I use it, there's no need for it, which is fantastic. So the issue that I found with wax is that I would inevitably get chunks of wax. Uh -huh. um, as you're running it along a wire, your wire is almost like a little knife and it yep. cuts right through it. And then you end up with these chunks. Well, those chunks don't allow the material to spin freely. Now we're talking about a millimeter space. But to me, if I'm making, I mean, I have like a ton of dubbing brushes. Yeah. Um, I want them to be to be made as well as they possibly can be. I don't want when I'm tying my fly that to be the hang up. So with that said, what I have done is when I go, and let me try to audibly say this so the people that are listening can make sense of it too. When I attach my wire on one side of the dubbing brush table, I stretch it across to the other side. So I start on my right side, which has the ball bearing. 
Uh-huh. I stretch it over to the left, which has the spring loaded crank. Or at least that's what mine has. Uh-huh. Uh, is that what yours has? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I have the upgrade stuff, but I like this one. And I'm I agree. afraid I'm going to break it. <laughs> understood so. understood yeah so when i go to attach i attach the right side i stretch across to the left i push that spring in ever so slightly uh-huh. and then i spin a couple times so that my wire is secured there uh-huh. okay i lay down my materials i stretch from the left now to the right i attach it to the right side and then when i go to pull my tray out i gently pull on the crank side and it tightens those wires a little bit and the material doesn't fall out. Um, so if I need to make a video on this, I can, but that's, yeah, you, you that's probably do just cause Rick's not going to believe you. I, I know, I know Rick, we can talk about it. Um, but that's what I've done. And I've been doing that for, I've had his table for quite some time now. Um, and no joke, uh, this is not an exaggeration. I've probably made more than 500 brushes on his table. Um, for myself and for others. And, and I just don't use wax with that said, if you're starting use wax, I I would rather somebody enter into this space and not get frustrated off the bat. Um, but if you're finding that you're having issues with wax and you've been making a fair number of brushes, give it a shot and just see, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot me a message. I'm happy to try to, to problem solve with people, but I know I derailed us there, but I did find it important that, Wax is maybe not necessary. Uh. You you didn't derail us, but you actually brought up what I found out becoming frustrated in the very beginning. I was leaving the table together just like it's supposed to be, stretching my wire from right to left, spinning it up, and then taking the wax and running the wax on the wire while it was on the table. Mm. This got wax on my table. Yes. And that, when I would spin, that wax would hold some of the other. So mm-hmm. when I do mine, not, not that you did it wrong, not that no, I'm no, no. doing it correctly, just difference. And, and for of course, of course. listeners that have never done a dubbing brush table, I, I have to look at myself in the mirror because I am so hot when I see myself, my temperature just goes through the roof. And for those of you... <laughs> that are ladies and not watching the YouTube video. I am, I am like six, five and I'm just like muscular and I look like I'm 23. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Imagine. A Me too. Boy. That's yeah. I mean, we're, we're a couple of pool boys here, you know, you just, but all seriousness aside, now I've gotten to the point where I will take that tray off. I will wax it and then I will, you know, Mr. Miyagi, clap your hands, rub them together, get some friction, and then I'll rub that wax to where I don't have the little bumps anymore. That's a and beautiful yeah, way to do that. I love that. Yeah. It, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's not the mm-hmm. simplest thing to do, but mm-hmm. it gets rid of those chunks. Yeah. Or even take a piece of like, um, you know how you use, if you're not using a cutthroat leader, you have to use a piece of black inner tube to straighten out your leader. Mm-hmm. Even that, have that out in the sun or something and grab it and stretch it and set it back out and sit it in the windowsill until you make the next one. Yeah. Uh, but that hot black rubber will pull through and that wax will sort of melt in there because... I got really frustrated. I'm not going to lie. And I know anybody new to this does, but you know, wax on the table, it's a, it's a real pain in the ass. Yeah. I'll also ask you, do you find, and perhaps the, the black rubber is a, a problem solver for this, but do you find that having wax in your hands affects your ability to lay out materials? Yes. Wax on my fingers. Definitely. Definitely mm-hmm. is. And so I generally keep a, a wet rag when I'm doing this. And I, mm-hmm. I honestly move from my normal fly tying space upstairs to where I have the kitchen available when mm-hmm. I'm making these. Yeah. So and I, and I will. So many times it just clumps up when I try to lay it down. So I try to use one hand for waxing and one hand for, and the waxing hand for scissors and then only use the other hand. Or I yell yeah. at one of my kids and make them come over and do it. <clears throat> there you go. I only have a dog at this point, so and she would not help at all. You um, want a kid? I've got one I can loan you. 
Look, man, I, I know how to find him if I need him. I think I'm good for now. Um, I appreciate Three it, though. brushes on the side of a van. You only get the cool kids. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> with that said, I've found, and perhaps this shows the level of intensity that I make dubbing brushes, and that's not a brag. That's kind of a sad thing. But um, it is. Anytime we get excited about making flies, this is just, we should just name this the Really Sad People Podcast. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm part of the crew. I'll I'll own up to it. But when I get really into it, and if I'm making a lot, my hands will start to sweat. Um, mm-hmm. And even just the sweat on my hands when I'm laying out a material like craft fur is a pain. It is mm-hmm. such a pain. And so that's another reason why I've kind of defaulted away from wax. Is it was taking more time and energy for me to apply the wax, try to fix the wax, get it off my hands, lay out the materials, spin it up that I tried to find a a workaround and it worked. So um, that's just another thing to think about. If people are going to use wax, just find a way to clean your hands very well. Um, The other thing is you said you go to a different part of your house. I will just throw out there. It is not always the cleanest thing to do in the entire world. Nor yeah, is fly tying in general. I don't clean the upstairs. The kids have to. Oh, okay. Now the kids are sounding more appealing. Um, win, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so just like fly tying in general, and if my desk is like anyone else's, I have stuff everywhere. Even if I'm tying with one material, I somehow have five colors of flash. I have three materials that I've never even opened up before that I bought in... 2004 and um (laughs) the same thing happens when i go to make dubbing brushes is i inevitably like let's say craft fur i inevitably pull out 10 different colors of craft fur and i don't know if you guys use craft fur regularly but when you brush out the the under fur (laughs) it floats through the air like a cloud and so you end up living in a space where there's clouds of craft fur marabou's in your nose i mean it's just it's everywhere so if you have significant others or anything like that, just be mindful of where you're doing this. Um, it is not the best. Another thing, sorry, I'm on a roll here. Um, another thing that once again, the intensity that were part of the sad kids club. What did you say it was? Ca- sad. Yeah, yeah, sad kid, that works. The sad, kids okay. club. <laughs> sad kids club. Um, the intensity of making dubbing brushes. Don't put your dubbing brush table underneath a vent or a fan. Yes. I, yes. That's a pro tip. Cause there is nothing more sad to me than taking 10 minutes to perfectly lay out your materials and you feel confident. And then you hear the AC kick on and part of your brain is really happy because it's getting cool. And part of your brain is really sad. Cause then all your stuff gets knocked off the table. It is just, it's a pain. So be mindful of where you're setting up shop to do this. Um, and don't have the dog jump on your lap while it's wagging its tail either. No I, way. One time the dog jumped on my lap and that tail went woof and all those fibers went off to the left. It was it's brutal. Yeah. Fido doesn't get any food that night. Um, so, yeah, exactly. And mine is named CC DeVille, so she just didn't get any of her, you know, normal drugs that she's used to. <laughs> Understood. Understood. All my dogs are named after rock stars. I'm sorry. Well, it's there you go. The hey, I, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. One other yeah. pro tip, too, is if you have, like, we have a handheld vacuum cleaner. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have something like that, it is really handy, and I, I at least am trying to rationalize to myself that it saves me time. I think it saves time to do a quick little vacuum in between different brushes, especially if you're switching flash or switching colors. Um, if I'm trying to make an all-white brush and I just finished an all-red brush, I'm inevitably going to have some sort of red something that falls into that all-white brush. And for probably 75% of the people that are making dubbing brushes, that doesn't matter. But if I'm making somebody a fly that has to be solid white, I don't want to have to sit here and try to pick out the one red fiber once it's tied. Um, So just clean your workstation the best you can. Um, This may be a little too much information and just show how um, psychopathical I am. I am actually working on figuring out a way to hook a shop back to my 
uh, I have, I'm getting ready to rearrange my entire fly room. So let's just start mm-hmm. with that because I have to have all the podcasting and recording stuff and everything set up for the new season of drinking on the fly. Mm-hmm. Of course, Kyle Ludwig, you can find it on YouTube. I'm getting ready to set all that up, but I want to put a, a large funnel connected to a shop back that when I lift up the lid, it sucks. It like turns it on. Ooh. And then I can just move everything, like all the pieces of feather, all the pieces of deer hair, everything just right there. And I've been thinking about this for a while. Like, okay. I mean, this is like, I've really been thinking about this. And, but having a clean spot, even when you're tying regular flies, is vital. Absolutely. I lose, I, I lose my hooks. I lose the entire box of hooks because I set something down in the right spot and I don't know. And I mean, Oasis and Rick has all the caddies and everything else. But if you're like me, once or twice a year, your room looks perfect. And the rest of the time, it's like the caddy is just like, Holy. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's just, yeah, it's got all, it's just covered up with stuff where you're like toss something here, or toss something there. And I yeah. can't be the only one. No, no. Sad Kids Club remark number 45 <laughs> of the podcast. I took a picture the last time mine was clean just so I could feel better about it. Like I can revisit it when I'm having a rough day. Um, you repost it on Instagram every three weeks. How did you like yeah. it? Here's mine. Yeah, people can see that like there's no leaves on the tree outside the window, and they know that it's summertime. And <laughs> somebody calls me out. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to keep it clean, but it, it does make a huge difference. And um, yeah, I love the shop vac idea, though. If you figure that out, you're gonna have to send yeah. me one. <laughs> I've got to figure how when you lift the lid, it moves the connection. So I'm thinking I've got an extra Raspberry Pi computer. And so okay. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, or yeah, not. yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to think of how to make a relay for that that will turn on the switch. That, or I'm just going to have to plug it in and ask the, uh, I can't say her name because if I tell her to turn something on, she will. I may just have have an outlet and just tell her to turn it on while I do it. Esmeralda, that that's might her name. even work too until she orders me pizza. That doesn't sound terrible. Um, well, yeah, I could do the pizza. If she'd deliver me pizza instead of just telling me the weather every five minutes, that'd be all right. Be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking either incorporating a home device with an outlet, something. But I'm thinking there's a way to do this. Mm-hmm. And I can store it in another room so I don't have to hear the noise and just have this. But then you reduce suction, so I may have to do. I'm trying to figure it out so I just don't have. Yeah, it's I'm overthinking all of it. So let's not even go there anymore. Oh, I love it, though. That's that's how I operate on a regular basis. In my head, I'm like, you could have a foot pedal that could work effectively. That would, um, that would be great. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of things you could do. But having and especially for dubbing brushes, because you don't want that pure white dubbing brush that you're going to use to go after ladyfish because you finally got a trip down to the ocean. And then all of a sudden you've got like bits of blue and green in there. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. 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 It makes a so, difference for sure. Yeah. So, okay. We haven't talked about wire yet. And I know that no, you had I mentioned mean, that a couple times. So I do want a big thing. Yes. And I buy my wire. I'm just going to say it. I buy it from Amazon. I buy, I think it's 32 gauge wire. I think you are spot is. on. Um, yeah, I, I also do that. Sorry to uni or whoever it is out there. Um, I use too much of it. It is just not, it's not effective. So I I use Master. I think it's called Master Wire. Um, That's it comes what I in- use, dude. It's like it's got the silver and it's Master Wire. Because I bought some Uni Wire and I kept popping it when I was tightening everything up. And then I it was probably your page that I found at the the Mastercraft or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm, and it's, mm-hmm. it's like what three bucks for a big old thing of it. It's pretty cheap. Yeah, it's two hundred fifty feet, I believe, and um. I want to say it's now like six dollars. All of $6. us are driving okay, up the market well, price. I was, going low. Um, I was going low to keep the listeners involved because they. There you go. Yo, yeah, it's it's free. Gotta, they pay you actually. Yeah, um, yeah they've got to go get stone fly nets, cutthroat leaders, and Tennessee trailers. I was trying really hard to keep them. You know. Understood. Understood. Yeah. So you mentioned thirty-two gauge, and that yeah. is a hundred percent where I recommend people start. Um, I can make seventy-five percent of what I'm trying to make 
with that um, that thickness of wire. It's not going to break. It's not going to break. Right. Um, unless you're really over tightening or brushing too hard, which right. that does happen. But, I mean, um, it's salt water through through bass, mm-hmm, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And maybe this is what you're referencing. It's very, very strong once it's on the fly. Like that's not going to come apart if you tie right. it in properly. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's strong. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would start at 32 gauge and then I would go either direction depending on your material. Um, so... I would change it depending on material density, material thickness, and also on the softness. Um, So perhaps that's similar to density, but I would argue not. Um, So for example, the higher the number, so 34 gauge is narrower than 32 gauge. So the higher the number, the smaller it is. I would go to 34 gauge for a lot of my finer craft fur brushes. Um, I find that it spins it up a little bit better. It's lighter if I'm putting it on to like a smaller fly. On the opposite end of things, if I'm making like a musky brush, or let me see if I've got something nearby that I can mention quickly. Um, You've just got a big y'all. old wad of brushes in your hand, dude. Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sad Kids Club number 46. Um <laughs> So for those of y'all who are watching, like this is made with a core and then it's got um, kind of longer pieces behind it. So I would mm-hmm. I would wrap this a few times at the front of a fly when I've put some feathers in the back, something like that. Um, I'm going to go up to 30. I, I say up. It's down in number, up in gauge um, or up in thickness. I would go to 30 or 28. 28 is really, really thick. Um, I have found it effective for really, really dense brushes. So the denser the brush, the thicker the wire, the softer the material, the lighter the wire. Start at 32, go to either end as you need. I will throw in one more thing, and I don't know if you've encountered this, Sean, but if you have too thin of a wire and too soft of a material, it will cut through your materials. Yes, I have had that happen. And that was I bought uni... I, th- I think it was uni small is mm-hmm. what I bought. And it was cutting through some of the stuff that I was using from uh, fly tires dungeon. And when yeah. I would brush it, it was, it was just slicing it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I also had a problem with that wire when I would spin it, it would spin tight, but w- wouldn't get as tight as I wanted to until the wire actually broke on yep. the dubbing brush and yeah again we're talking about doing things the right way you've spent 15 minutes cutting this fiber and laying it out in a calico color to make a <laughs> a friggin uh oh what are the, uh, the little bitty fish the little the little calico fish we have around here uh dace you, huh a dace Sculpin. 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 Oh, no, Sculpin. I wasn't even you're, you're tying a calico color to make a sculpin, and all of a sudden, all that is gone. Yeah. All right? And it's 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 not like it's costing you a ton of money. It's just costing you a ton of time. Yeah. Um. So knowing your wire, starting with that 32 gauge, and then if you buy it from uni or whoever, buy the heaviest one, and then go down one spool at a time until you mm-hmm. break it. Mm-hmm. I, I can't, yeah. you know, and if you're, if you're looking at anything else, that 32 gauge is amazing. Yeah, I, I really, I definitely think we need to support fly tying and um, fly tying suppliers as much as we possibly can. I think that's super right. crucial. But there's also, also the point that they could give us a thing, a 32 gauge wire for hell of a lot cheaper than what they're charging us nine or 10 bucks for the little small wire that might as well be tinsel. So I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to go ahead and get salty about that. Sean said it, not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're looking for more sponsors and here I'm not even charging mine yet for this season. I know, I know. Um, yeah. And so you brought up different thicknesses. You brought up that it could pop early. Um, I'm curious if you've ever tried to problem solve your, you spinning up a brush, it breaks on the table. Yeah. Do you ever try to finish that brush? Nope. I just, I, I just crack another cold beer and throw that shit away. I I, hear you. I'm done. At that point in time, I'm like the hell with it. It's beer 30, throw that shit away. 
dog. Um, so we differ there too. Um, do you really try to fix them? I do. And I'll oh. maybe this will help you at some point because it inevitably will happen again in your life. I'm sure of it, Sean. Um, I take that end that broke. Um, so one end is still attached to the dummy brush table. One uh-huh. end is loose and it's probably spun up 15 times and you're cursing at it and stuff. If you're anything like me. Well, um, yeah, I swear a lot, dude. I, I, yeah. I, I teach high schoolers. I swear. Constantly. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, so I take, uh, let me see. I don't, have one nearby this will work though um i take a pen that has a pen cap and i will take that broken end of wire usually there's maybe two inches or an inch and a half or so sticking off the end and it's two wires spun up together um i will take that and wrap it around my pen cap um the part that you would put the tongue on the pen cap right exactly exactly yeah the piece that you bite off and spit at your girlfriend whenever you're in high school Right. Yeah, you're yeah. really connected with high school culture. I see. Um, yes, I am. It's like the blowgun of love. Ah, wow. I'm going to see if my wife thinks that's uh, cute later on. Um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I attach that wire and spin it up on the tongue, which I didn't know was the word, but I like it, on the tongue of the pen cap. And then I hold my pen cap out and spin the other side. Um, really? And it works just fine. Brushing it is a little harder because you're now holding, yeah. you're brushing, but I have found that to be a way that you can save it. It may not be as beautiful as when you started, but typically when that wire breaks as you're spinning it up, it's not at the very start when everything is loose. It's already spun up some. Yeah, um, and you're only going to lose a little bit of it when it unravels. And it, Right. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you this. We're talking about brushing brushes. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. enjoy using the metal dog brush. What brush With, do you use to brush out your fibers? And I know there's, you use more fibers than I do. I'm only making FTD fiber brushes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What brushes do you suggest for what fibers? All of the brushes that I use with any regularity for, let me go into my brain here and see if this is correct. I think for almost all of my fibers, except natural materials, I use just a wire dog brush. It looks like there's all these little claws sticking out of it almost. I don't really know of a better way to say it. Yeah, they're, um, they're kind of bent down in one area. They brush absolutely. in the same direction. That's what I use. It's like a little square with a handle. I think I've got one if I wouldn't not all these beer cans over some alcoholic whenever I reach for it. I've got mine downstairs or else I could grab mine. But I, yeah, if you but, go to the, the pet store, you'll yeah. find them. Um, and I've gotten all mine from the pet store. They probably yeah. think I'm a little strange because I've gone through a few of them. Um, sad Kids Club number 47. Um, <laughs> Hobby Lobby, so, Michael's in the pet store. Yeah, yeah. Joanne's Fabrics. Um, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I usually mm. try to bring my wife with me so there's less questions. But when yeah. you walk out with three different bright color marabou boas they're kind of like well um he's eccentric so um so i do use (laughs) go ahead (laughs) oh i was just gonna say i've got a neighbor who's a beautiful woman i could raid his closet anytime i wanted to (laughs) well there you go Uh, (laughs) um i do use that wire dog brush the square top like you were talking about a rectangle top Mm -hmm. um for almost everything um so that's what i brush my brushes out um on my dubbing brush table, I said brush too many times and got lost. Um, <laughs> That's the that, hell of, we need to have a better word than dubbing brush. Dubbing thingy. Um, so I use the wire brush uh, to brush out the dubbing thingy on the dubbing brush table. And um, there on the go, dubbing thingy table. On the yeah, dubbing. there you go. There you go. Man, I'm getting tripped up. Um, <laughs> You know how much so, we're going to get in trouble. He's going to call you, and then he's going to call me. We're not well, even going to say his name. Who I'm not even going to answer. Um, <laughs> do not disturb. Um, so I use that that wire dog brush for almost every fiber. Um, if I'm brushing it before I'm cutting it off the hank, um, oh. or if I'm brushing it in the dubbing brush thingy on the dubbing or, oh man, I'm messing it up. I'm trying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to everyone listening at this point. I'm trying to run a bit way longer. And than you're not even run. drinking, dude. Um, 
No, I know. I got a sparkling water. Um, <laughs> Not me. <laughs> understood. Understood. Yeah, mine's clear and bubbly. Um, yeah. So I do use a comb when it comes to like brushing out the under fur of um, deer hair. I tie a lot of right. deer hair flies well, as well. Like before mm-hmm. you put it into there. But that, right. that brings me to this. So we're, with dog brushes we're cool with. How are you making the number one, the deer hair, but number two, you've mentioned marabou like three times. Are you using marabou? In brushes? Yeah. I have. I do not do it with regularity because there is nothing messier in this world. Um, But how does it look? It looks pretty cool. You have to put the non-fluffy side into the wire and the fluffy side sticks out. Now you can... I don't know about you. Like if I am tying up, I don't know, um, a woolly bugger and I've got a marabou tail, I'm probably going to pull off some pieces of that quill so that I can get what I need to tie in. You can take all all your scraps. Yeah, all that is waste after that, but. Unless you put it in a dubbing brush. Um, So. I I am so excited. I yeah, the there you go. Be cleaning, the kids are going to be cleaning the kitchen so bad. <laughs> yeah. So you can do that with a lot of things too. So I use a lot of craft fur. I really like craft fur. Mm-hmm. You brush out what's in the middle of that craft fur. That's dubbing. Like yeah. you can you can use that. So I I have just bags and bags of under fur from craft fur. I also, like right next to me, have the ends of my hanks of different like EP t- style fibers, Congo hair, that kind of stuff. What? The very ends of it are, they're not all lined up. Um, so that's a problem in and of itself. And sometimes they're a bit more like frazzled and all over the place. Um, yeah. So I keep all mine into a container right next to where I'm making my brushes. And then you can just make random brush colors with what you've got. So I'll take it and rip it through my hands a couple times. And then I'll lay it out and make a random brush color. And um, you saw a few minutes ago, I have way too many brushes. That's just yeah. how I operate. You um, made more than we made at the entire sow bug. And I made them for eight hours a day for three days. Yeah. Like I said, I've used, I've used he who should not be names table quite a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've spent a lot of time working with that table. And, um, and so I make these random colors. Sometimes I use them. Sometimes I throw them off to a friend who ties. And uh, one of my favorite things that I've done, and perhaps I'm going to get a bunch of people asking me about this afterwards, but from time to time, when I build up too high of a stock of brushes, um, I will, I'll sell them for a relatively cheap price, cheaper than you would get on the market enough for me to get back material cost. Um, And and then it's not much. Right, right, right. Um, And then the beauty of that is, and this one of my more favorite things to do in the community, I see what people create out of something that I've made. So I make this dubbing brush for an intended purpose in my head. So maybe I sit down and make 10 brushes for game changers and seven of them get used and three of them don't. And they've been sitting in my box here for three months. I'll send them off to somebody and they're making crab flies for the flats. Or they're- and yeah. I actually wanted to talk about those because I've I've watched videos on crab flies and they're a pain in the ass. But then I've they seen can guys be. like dubbing brush, boom, and I'm like, dude. It's so much faster. Um there are certain like you can't really make toads, that's a specific type of fly as well. Um quans is another one, where sometimes you tie in the materials in little clumps. Um mm-hmm. you can't really mimic the same way with a dubbing brush because the dubbing brush goes all the way around, but you can wrap it all the way around and trim the top and the bottom and you still get a flat profile. So it can still be used. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. But But it's for the amount of time you're doing for guide fly. If you're tying guide flies, and that's the thing that Kyle and I have the biggest problem with is Kyle doesn't know what a guide fly is. He spends like Mm -hmm. 45 minutes on a fly. Mm -hmm. I spend like, if it's, if I spend more than 10 minutes, my God, I'm losing that one on my own. Understood. Understood. <laughs> I'm yeah, putting well, that baby into a tree on my own. I've done some 
embarrassing things to get flies back. Let me tell you. Um, almost all that I fish are game changers that take me an hour to two hours to tie. And then deer hair Ooh. flies, which take me an hour to tie. And um, yeah, I've taken oh. HOA canoes and things. I've I've done oh. some sad things. Oh. On that note, can I, would, would you, I hope you've had a good experience with the podcast. Oh can yeah. Can I ask you to come on to Drinking on the Fly this season? Sure. I don't, I have not listened to that one. So YouTube show. It's, it's just a YouTube show. Oh, well, yeah, sure. It's it's, it's Kyle and I, we try different drinks and then we tie flies. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So maybe I will tie like four guide flies and show you how to tie those. And then Kyle will tie like a half a fly. And then you come back the next week and see the other half because we're trying to limit to a two hour show. Yeah, or I'll tie the front half of Kyle's fly while he's tying the back half, and together yeah. we'll glue them. We'll use some super glue. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a fun little thing. But uh, the deer hair, uh, this is the one that really gets me. Are you you're, you said you're putting the butt ends of the deer hair into the wire and then spinning it? So yes. So I will say. I've done this more with bucktail, which is still technically deer hair, than right. I have. That's what I meant I meant bucktail, but yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm putting the butt section in, and so with I'm pulling out one of these big old musky changer things here again. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you can really see. I've got a, a bit of a uh, color you can fade. See it's, you've got the the darker color down here, and then uh, and that's a natural dyed color. So when mm-hmm. you buy a bucktail, they're more brown and dark at the base. And I think mm-hmm. everybody that's bought a bucktail has noticed that. So it looks like you've tied it in. And excuse me if I'm wrong, you've tied it in with those darker colors and then you're flaring it out on that. After the dubbing brush, when you tie it in, it's flaring out and making a nice big water mover for a musky fly. So actually that entire front section of that fly is all one dubbing brush. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've got three different colors. And I lay them in with the butt sticking out. So I, I personally like, well, okay, let me rephrase. If this is the wire, well, uh, (laughs) the wire is in between the two. Yeah. And this is the tip of my bucktail and this is the base of my bucktail. Right. So we're going left to right, guys. I'm putting it kind of not quite halfway, but the tip section is longer but I do want the bucks butt section sticking out the other side because that is effectively a bulkhead brush. Right, and that's um, making the water move because you've right, got right, 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 right. That. So you're bit you're bending the bucktail. You're not just tying in the base of the bucktail and having everything around it. Right, like right. if I were going to tie a deceiver, I would want to tie closer to the butt end, but because you're mm-hmm. moving more water, you're tying it what a quarter up let's just say a quarter maybe it's a little bit more than a quarter up and Mm -hmm. that way it folds over on itself and you've got the water movement but you've still got the tips yeah indeed Indeed. yeah yeah you got that spot on um yeah yeah. i almost know what i'm doing there you go and so jumping (laughs) there you go um a call back to what we were talking about earlier This is where wire size is really important. So I started making dubbing brushes with bucktail in them with like 32 gauge wire. Cut through the bucktail immediately. Uh, So you have to bump up that wire thickness a little bit. The other thing about bucktail is it, it is just like a lot of other deer hair. It flares, which is cool, Uh which it's hollow. And so you don't have to spin it up as tight as you would a synthetic. A synthetic you're trapping in between. It doesn't really squish down very much. Like a, a piece of Congo hair, the tiniest little piece, is probably not going to compress much as it's being squoze. Squoze is not a technical term, but we're going to make it a technical term. Um, I love it. <laughs> as you're squoozing the, the uh, Congo hair, it's not really going to compress. Bucktail is the opposite. So you can have a nice piece of bucktail that is thick at the base, tapers off to the tip, which is part of the beauty of bucktails. It's naturally tapered. If you put it in between two wires and you spin it up in a dubbing brush, it will compress it. So it kind of locks that hair in there. So you don't want to overspin your dubbing brushes with bucktail in them because you will start to cut the fibers. So 
What I recommend is spinning up a dubbing brush worth of bucktail. And I will say it uses a lot of bucktail. So that's kind of a pain. Um, but well, not if spinning. You hunt. Well, this is true. I do not hunt. So if you want to trade me some uh, of those friends, I will I, take well, those friends. Actually, I can just I can just mail you a shit ton of bucktails next year. Uh, next uh, December. You may have to I take will... the bone out and salt it. I'll put it in dry ice and send it to you. But yeah, I can get you at least. I can get you at least seven that I've shot with all the different permits and counties that I hunt in. I will be waiting at my front door starting tonight, eagerly right, get excited. You some dye. Get you some dye and be ready. There you go. There you go. Um, so it, it traps that bucktail in. So what I recommend is spinning it up in the brush. Do about two thirds of the amount of spinning that you would do with a synthetic fiber. Okay, and so then a lot less than like a third less spinning. Right. And then go to one of the ends where you're not going to really mess up your brush and just gently pull on one of the bucktail uh-huh. pieces. If it's sliding, you need to spin it more. If it's that's not good, sli- That's a good point for anything that you're spinning, though. Go to one of the very tips and pull because I've made some that I thought were done and they weren't. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's definitely a good thing to do. Another pro tip, this just comes from making so many that you end up messing a bunch of them up. Um, If you ever clump up your material, Uh it let's say you've spun up the entire brush and you can see one chunk of material that has not really separated and allowed it to spin. Uh You can do the same thing and pull out some of it to decrease the density of that chunk and then spin it a little bit more and the brush will catch up in that spot. Does that make sense? Yeah. That that does. And I have had that problem before and trying to figure out I've backed off and tried mm-hmm. to move it and it didn't work well because the wax was already there again the mm-hmm. wax the wax was already there and it wanted to it wanted to cross thread mm-hmm. it didn't want to separate fully it wanted to cross thread so right. that is a problem that I've had I like the idea of pulling those cross threaders out that mm-hmm. makes a lot more sense yeah yeah um, one other thing, just if anybody has listened this far in and still does not tie their own or make their own dubbing brushes, yeah, um, this is a high quality podcast. It is the highest numbers? of qualities. Do you know how many phone calls you're going to get after this podcast? Because there are like Bring it six, on. there are like six podcasts and I'm not, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I'm not, I'm not angry. This show has been around for over five years. There are six other podcasts that two weeks after I have a guest, they drop my guest. So you're going to get a bunch of phone calls. Well, you are the OG. This is the first podcast I've been on. So I'm telling you, I, I credit Sean. Um, and any yeah. podcast you get invited to, you've got to mention me. Okay. All, All right. right. Um, until I hit it big, Sean, and then we but may have to part kick my ass to the curb <laughs> like everybody else I've loved in my life. I understand no. it's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Sad Kids Club, number 48. Um, we have a running tally. Um, yeah, we do. There you go. Yeah. So if anybody's listened this long in and does not make their own, I just want to point out the reason that we use wire for brushes. Um, a dubbing loop can be made as we've talked about it takes far too long but it can be made and um you're and using you thread and then you you buy like four tools and then you buy that stonfo tool thinking it's going to solve the problems but it doesn't either you've got 70 to 80 dollars in spinning tools yeah it sucks. yeah yeah and then you see somebody online that's using like a nut and a bolt and they're spinning up better <laughs> loops than you yeah. are um yeah so the the downfall of a loop besides the time potentially is you can't cut it and save the rest for later. Right. Um, it's just gone. The, right. The beauty of wire is that you can clip it anywhere in between and within reason it will not unravel. Um, so I can use half a brush for one fly and then three weeks later use the other half and I haven't had to glue the ends or anything like that. Um, it's a really effective way um, to make a dubbing brush, not on the fly and save it for later. Yes. I did the math on my carp crate, the uh, brain bug cells, six flies out of one brush. That's awesome. Well, it's a little bitty hook, but yeah. Yeah. But one brush, you're making six flies. 
And if you're trying to do that in a dubbing loop, you're not going to get the alternated color. You're not going to get the layered color because I like that white down deep. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I like that white just a hint through. Go to breenbugs.com. Look up the carp crepe. It's my fly. I'm not... I'm tired of being like humble about it. I, for like <laughs> three months, I was like, oh, well, you can, you know, uh, no, hell with it. Go buy one. They're great. Go buy one, people. They're <laughs> freaking awesome, dude. I'm just saying, and while you're there, buy a bunch of shit from Don because he's really cool. Um, get there a couple go. of pulse poppers because Neil's cool. Just, just go over there and spend a bunch of money. But um, you have, when you spin a dubbing brush, you don't have the ability to put layered colors in there either a dubbing loop a dubbing loop yes a dubbing loop you don't have the ability to make the layered colors a dubbing brush you can make the layered colors where the white you you can take it and for the carp crepe the white goes down first Mm -hmm. and then the green or then the pink and then the green and then when you Mm -hmm. spin it that glow white shows up in the center the hot pink is covered up by the hot green, so you just have... And, of course, I'm measuring out how much I do. Sure. So there's more white than pink, and about the same amount of green as white, so the pink is just an accent. Uh, an accent. But when you do a dubbing loop, you can't get that accurate. I don't mm-hmm. Do you feel yeah, the same way? I would agree. I, I've had a much harder time... With just the control aspect of a dubbing loop, um, it's hanging, it's vertical, mostly. I mean, you can make it more horizontal. You don't really have a tray underneath. Like, there's just less control. Whereas mm-hmm. a dubbing brush, you can start, you can walk away from it, you can come back to it. It's just, it's more user friendly to me in the long run. You can um, get mad, you can beat the dog for its tail running across the top of it. There you go. You can call you can your children to come clean stuff up. Start to jump on your lap and run it outside. There you go. You know. There you go. Yeah. You can run to uh. the air conditioner and turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be quick. Uh, yeah. You can, just tell so, your, you can just tell your home device to turn it off and turn your vacuum cleaner on. Yeah. Yeah. And order your pizza. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, dubbing brushes are awesome. I mean, obviously, like I'm I'm a bit fanatical about them. I realize that not everyone will have the same level of enthusiasm about spun up fly tying materials, but to me, they're pretty freaking cool. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to put you on the spot, and I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to because I've had three beers, and I'm going to say this. Go for it. I can handle. I it. will pay you personally the shipping. I will I will PayPal you the shipping. If somebody from this podcast leaves a comment or however however you decide a, a personal message to you through Instagram and say your Instagram again. Okay. It's at McFall Flies. M as in Michael, C as in Cat, F as in Frank, A as in Alex, L as in Lima Bean, L as in Lima Bean flies. So McFall flies. I will PayPal you the money to send them a brush and I will get you some water, silk, Congo hair, big game hair, whatever you want. I will have a package of that sent to you. If somebody, and that's a two part, they have to contact you for a dubbing brush and they have to tag all of us after they make that brush. Does that work for you? Yeah, that sounds good. I think that works great. So if we get this set up, I will pay you for the expense of mailing it, and I will replace the materials that you mail because that's the kind of guy I am. But I want to see what you guys that can do with dubbing brushes are. And I'll tell you what, Rick doesn't know this, but you just tell Rick that I'm offering 50% off, and then when he says no, you know I'm lying because (laughs) I'm not. But if you call right now and tell Rick, you can you can really aggravate him. And I think we've done enough of that. So that ought to be fun. We've done a really good job. Oh. Oh, and you and your no wax. That is just that's bullshit. Look, the proof is in the pudding, buddy. Um. <laughs> so, OK, uh, I'm right. I talked to you about a couple things off the air. So don't jump off, guys. This has been one of our longer podcasts. I mean, we're well over an hour, and you can tell that Ryan's going to be back on. 
I mean, you guys have heard the podcast long enough. You know when I like somebody, they're becoming a regular. So please, go and check out the flyarmory.com. Actually, it's flyarmory, not the. It's just flyarmory.com. You guys heard them a couple of weeks ago. Stupid simple fly tying, harass Ben. You heard him last week. I don't know what happened, but I guess we got so drunk when we were doing the show, my camera was tilted at an angle when we got done. I don't know <laughs> what was going on. Guys, this is Sean with Kayak Flyer. Ryan, once again, plug all your socials and everything that you are either on or that you are a major contributor to. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ryan McFall. Um, you can email me at humblepottery at gmail.com. Uh, if you have any direct questions, you can also message me on Instagram. Please give me a follow if you feel so inclined at McFall flies. Uh, I do contribute a lot towards the game changer group on Facebook. It's called game changer fly. Um, game changer is all one word and, uh, hope to see you there. I appreciate the time, Sean. And we didn't even get to talk about the humble pottery thing, which I thought was extremely interesting. So we'll have to do that (laughs) next time. Sounds good. I tell you what, um, i Again, we're going to have to figure some things out for the show, and we'll go on from there. But I appreciate you listening. Please tell a friend. Let's bump some of these numbers up a little bit more and get some of these guys that just steal my great guests out of business. That that was kind of rude, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think it's fine. No, I think it's rude because these guys steal my guests, like literally. I had I have a bunch of guests, and then like a month later, they're on these other shows. Which shows? Like, there's a bunch of other podcast fly fishing shows that people don't even, like, know about, except that they throw tons of money, and then they steal all my great guests, just, my guests are the best, don't you agree? <laughs> well, I'm one of them, so yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>